This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs The Playbook, and I am so excited. I got the future of The Playbook on today. Paul Rivera, CEO of Electra Mechanica Vehicles Corp. It's an incredible, I, I, I watched the website, I watched the video, Paul, and I got to tell you, it must be so exciting uh, to be the CEO of this company because that vehicle is extraordinary, and I can just see so many applications for the vehicle itself, but more importantly, so many people driving it around. Yeah. It, first of all, you're right. It, this is a dream job for me. So I, I get excited just talking about how cool the job is. And you're right. It, it's a cool vehicle. It's a cool company. And I mean, I'll tell you that when, you, when, when we get a chance, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of how I came across Electromechanica because I've known them for years be, before I became CEO. And when they came to me and asked me if I wanted to become CEO, I was like, wow, what a cool thing for me to get that opportunity. And uh, it's just a great, great opportunity for me. It certainly is. You know, I was CEO of the world's first smartphone back in 1999. It was called a convergence device. The difference between the two situations is I was trying to run a kind of a comparative emotional analysis of being CEO of two different companies is that your company is for real. Mine was way too early. And, you know, the technology, it must have been more like Fisker, you know, or the Karma car really early on where, you know, great idea, really cool. But, you know, th this isn't a mass uh, type of an opportunity. When I see the, you know, your drive solo marketing campaign, the car itself, or I'm, I, ca I call it a vehicle. We, you know, yeah. it's so interesting. Uh, with all the critical driving issues that exist today, you can see that this isn't for the future. It may look like the future, but it's actually something that's very practical, cost efficient, environmentally friendly today, like right today. And it is. And, and I think, you know, you hit on a few things all in one sentence there, right? So let's break it down a little bit. The first thing is that compared to a lot of other companies out there, Dave, we, we actually, you know, we're a lot further ahead than a lot of these other companies that are startups, right? I mean, we we already have done a lot of the engineering of the vehicle. We've already got the vehicle into production, right? We already have retail outlets rolling out on the western part of the United States, as you're very aware, right? We're already talking to a number of fleet accounts that are out there, right? And we're about to announce a U.S. assembly facility, even though we already have one facility that's already making the vehicle for us in China. And so... Very, very different than what you described in the early days of, you know, uh, Henrik and Fisker in the early days, right? Or, or some of the other companies that you mentioned, because at that time, that was very, very early days. And it was kind of, it was before things had, had evolved for those companies, right? And here in our case, this company was founded in 2015. All of the legwork is now done. And we're really at a point right now where we're right on the cusp of really starting to put the keys into the hands of customers today, getting those first vehicles out on the road. And I know I've been saying that for a little while, and some call me conservative, but I just want to make sure that we dot the I's across the T's because you get one shot to launch a car, you get one shot to launch a vehicle. And I just want to make sure that we do it right. And um, it's an exciting time period for us. A lot's going on right now. And, you know, as a startup, you have been through a litany and an evolution of, number one, the relationship to become CEO, and then your relationship as CEO. I was hoping you could share with us, you know, one, how you, your awareness to the vehicle came and how you developed the relationship where they feel confident and credible enough to offer you the job, and then how your perspective changed once you got the job. Yeah. All right. So, so. I, as I mentioned earlier, I became aware of Electromechanica back in 2016, first 2016. And at that time, I was president of a company called Ricardo. Ricardo is a very, very well-known technical consultancy, global technical consultancy, publicly traded company, traded on the London Stock Exchange, do about 600 automotive projects a year. And I was the president of the U.S. division of Ricardo. And Jerry Kroll, who was the then CEO and the founder of Electromechanica, he came to our company and he said, I have this 
one person, single occupant electric vehicle called the Solo. And I'm wondering whether or not Ricardo can help me do some engineering for the vehicle. And at that time, we embarked on some engineering projects for the vehicle, helping him do a variety of different things. And, you know, first met Jerry and became aware of the company based in Vancouver and saw their engineering team and their capabilities at that time. And that's how we first that's how I first became aware of them. And at that time, I was based in Silicon Valley. And, you know, fast forward three years and uh, well, two and a half years, actually. And in, in late 2018, early beginning of 2019, actually, I got a call and uh, it was from a, a firm. They were looking for a CEO for a company that was publicly traded out of Vancouver. It was an EV startup. And they said, we're looking for somebody. It's a Vancouver-based company, and and would you be interested? And I said, it's it's Electromechanica. And they said, oh, you know the firm. And I said, I absolutely know the firm. And I said, I think that I could really lend my experience to that firm. I think that I could help take that company and bring in my thirty years of automotive experience, large-scale automotive programs, engineering background, and help really make a difference. And what, what's really changed from the time I became CEO until where we are today is that Jerry was a brilliant, brilliant entrepreneur, visionary guy. And to his credit, he just realized that he needed somebody to come in and now make that vision a reality. Putting a vehicle on the road, Dave, is very challenging. Understanding all of the different things that need to happen to take it from small scale and, and a concept into production is very, very different. And so I came in and we had to realize that maybe we weren't quite there yet. We needed to make some engineering modifications to the vehicle, make some changes. Um, and that's what we did. And between the time I came in in August of 2019 until the time that we put it into production in August of 2020, we went back. We re-engineered the steering geometry, the, cali the, uh, the electronic power steering uh, calibration. We also wanted, I wanted to put in some additional safety features in the vehicle to make sure that we knew that the occupant was as safe as possible. And we put in things like additional side impact protection, torque limiting stability control. And meanwhile, we were also setting up the strategy of how we were gonna go out to market. And uh, we launched in 2020. And here we are now. And like I said, it's an exciting time period for us. And there seems to be like two schools in this space that you know, I deal with a lot on the investment side and multi, believe it or not, for those who aren't familiar, billions of dollars are being raised uh, in this space. Billions of dollars, especially in the uh, utility and fleets uh, portion of it. Uh, the first, I think, EV truck, you know, the biggest names, uh, in the venture capital world, all dive yes. in two billion overnight. I've had my eye on this space forever. You guys actually are dealing in both spaces. You have a retail network uh, with new West Coast locations, but you also are looking at the utility and fleet side of it, which is, I think, very unique because most of the other people are going the other direction. They're looking at uh, in the utility and fleet space the bigger vehicles. Now that the battery life, you actually especially with COVID, you know, these solo deliveries are extremely uh, valuable and you seem to have pivoted very quickly into that space. Yeah, I, and, and believe it or not, we, we pivoted before COVID. COVID, you know, when, when I became CEO, it, it became apparent to me that we had a very unique vehicle that offered three parts to an ecosystem. Jerry, he had he had the idea that there was a great retail market. The vehicle was originally created for the retail side and for people that were commuting. And it was it was created for urban driving challenges and primarily around commuters. Right. The vehicle has a 100 mile range. It has an 80 mile per hour top speed, all electric. It has a lot of the same comfort features that you're used to in your daily passenger vehicle. So it has Bluetooth. It has a heated seat. It has a backup camera. It's technology enabled, right? But then I thought, you know, there's so many other 
purposes where this vehicle makes sense. So you mentioned fleets, right? I look around and I think to myself, think about how many single occupant fleets there are. Not so much, I mean, there's so many on those larger commercial vehicles that you talk about already, right? And there's there's a lot of companies going after that space, a lot that, that you already cover probably. But think about all of the smaller the smaller applications where there's a single occupant in the vehicle. So let's talk about, for example, fast food delivery, pizza delivery. If you think about like even the idea around um, companies that are going out and delivering groceries or prescription medication, companies that are doing security around parking lots, for example, or even technicians that are going out to a job site and just doing, you know, technical services, for example, repairing copiers and those kinds of things. There's so many single occupant fleets. So our vehicle with a uniquely styled cargo box on the back, it's just perfect for us to be able to offer a really cool vehicle for those kinds of applications where the vehicle doesn't have to go more than 100 miles, stays within a city radius, it charges in under four hours, it's ready to go again. And then with COVID, since you bring up COVID, you know, what happened was, especially in the food delivery side of things, these, these restaurants today, these fast food chains today, these delivery services today, restaurants today are going through great lengths to prepare food in a sanitary environment, right? And when you think about giving that food to a third party, they're no longer in control, right? They're giving away profits to a third party. And then the final thing is, you know, a lot of times they're giving that food to an individual who may be using their family vehicle and it has, you know, a baby seat in the back with crushed up goldfish. It may be not as clean, but the solo is a really, really self-contained environment. So it's kind of ideal. And because it's total cost of ownership to operate the vehicle is beautiful because it's the lowest total cost of ownership other than any other EV out there right now, it really makes it ideal for fleet applications. And then the last part of the ecosystem for us is the idea that maybe there's people that don't want to buy it, and maybe there's fleets that don't want to use it, but maybe there's just people that are questioning ownership models in general. And so the idea of being able to walk up Use your iPhone, use your Android, unlock it, take it off of an EV infrastructure and share the vehicle and take it from one part of a city to another part of a city, whether it's Palo Alto into San Francisco or whether it's, you know, from Santa Monica into Beverly Hills and put it back onto an infrastructure. That's the idea long term to be able to share them. So the three parts of our ecosystem are, of course, retail for those that want to own it, fleet and commercial for the fleets, and then the ability to solo share. And so that's what makes us so uniquely different than anybody else out there. That's amazing. One thing I'm thinking about whenever there's a technology like that being launched, which you have seen the predecessors build a market, you've seen the venture capitalists build interest and capitalization behind. For me, there's always a hidden ROI. Uh, you know, when I work within different companies, I, I'm always amazed. Like there's one thing that, you know, nobody really thinks about. Uh, that's, you know, obviously the environment, obviously, you know, there, there's a bunch of things that because of the size of the vehicle, but what do you think the hidden, it could be in any three of the aspects, but you know, what's that one ROI that most people don't think about that you see the vehicle having uh, from being so uh, deep in the project. What, what's that big ROI that most people don't think of? Well, I think that there's a couple of things. I mean, first of all, we're we're looking to to you know revolutionize. I know, and I know a lot of people use that word, and it's it's and it's almost become too loose, right? But I, I think we're looking to really revolutionize that space between micro mobility, which is kind of that last mile served right uh where people are in that electric scooters and they're in that that electric bike space trying to get from their workspace to their office but you're out in the elements or that passenger car 
space, but you still have three or four empty seats. You're using an oversized powertrain, even in electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are still sized that way too, right? But we're really looking at that space that's in between. So we're looking at the most efficient tool, most efficient electric vehicle in that space between micromobility and passenger car. Now, within that space, I think the hidden ROI is, of course, we're talking about, you know, things like really reducing the carbon footprint, but not just the carbon footprint. Think about the fact that if we can create a uniquely different ecosystem within that footprint as well, meaning that just because of the size of our vehicle too, right? The vehicle itself is so small. It's only a 70, you know, it's seven foot wide by 10 foot long, right? So our, our overall footprint is smaller. You don't need to have as much uh, overall space for parking. You don't need to have as much overall space on the highway, right? You're taking out, think about all the benefits of looking 300 yards in front of you, 300 yards behind you. You don't need to have, it's really the minimalist thought process, questioning every time, am I driving solo? Then do I need to have a big SUV around me to go to and from work? If I'm a security company and all I'm doing is monitoring security at a parking, at a parking garage or at a mall, or in a, in a community, do I really need to drive a Ford Escape with three or four empty seats and run the carbon footprint, run the gasoline engine just to make my two mile loop every night? So I think the hidden ROI is all of the carbon footprint, the reduction in size. It's all of those other benefits that are coming from revolutionizing that space between micromobility and passenger car. I love it. I like to think of it as, you know, one and a half martinis. You know how they say one martini is not enough, two is too many. You know, exactly. one, one, one scooter is not enough. The vans and the trucks are too many. This is the one and a half. -er. So it's per, it's perfect and provides so much uh, to our country, especially in a time of need in so many different areas, environmentally, delivery, what just necessity of getting that last mile taken care of. Obviously, you talked about the carbon footprint and the efficiencies, but uh, for me, the productivity of getting in and out of vehicles, you know, I joke around, I have a driver in a car and I used to tell my wife, it pays for itself just to be able to get out in front of some place, right, and get picked up. And I, I thought that is what hit in our ROIs that people don't realize when you're delivering things or even yourself in meetings, when you're 10 feet long, it's so much easier to get out right in front uh, and it's safer than a bicycle or a moped. So, and also obviously if you're in a suit, there's so many different things. So in incredible journey, incredible product. Where can people find an order today? They can order it. I know it's coming in uh, er early 2021, but when, how can they order the electric Mechanica? Yeah. So today, if they wanted to order one, they can go on our website and they can place a $250 completely refundable pre-order right? So they have the ability to, to hold their spot and the list is getting longer, right? So if, if they're interested, they should do that right now, right? Um, so we're, we, we, started, we started with the idea that we would deliver on the West Coast first. Why? Well, because it makes a lot of sense. So our first retail location was in Century City and our retail locations are quite different as well, Dave. They're, they're, they're essentially pop-up locations in the middle of higher-end shopping centers in the flow of traffic. These are not heavy brick and mortar stores, right? But these are booths that are attended. You can see the vehicle, touch the vehicle. So you can either go to one of our retail locations, and we have 10 of them now between California and Southern California, Northern California, Oregon, and Arizona, right? And we're rolling out more soon, by the way. I'm excited by that. But you can also pre-order online and you can do that as well. And so we'll start in Los Angeles. Why Los Angeles? 4.6 million commuters, right? The traffic in LA, anybody knows, is a nightmare, right? So it just makes a lot of sense to, to roll out there. It's, it's also, let's be honest, it's a land of visibility, right? A lot of people see things there, right? So it's a great place to, to launch and be seen in that area, right? So we think that we'll be very successful there. And we're, we're excited by, 
having the vehicles kind of roll out from there. And then we've, we've got other retail locations, like I say, in Northern California and in the Phoenix area as well and in Portland, Oregon. And then so you'll start to see the vehicles proliferate from there. And then we'll roll out into other locations throughout the United States. And then, um, but we have global interest in the vehicle too, but we really want to be careful, Dave, because like I said to you, one of the biggest things for me is making sure we get it right. I've been around this game for a long time. I want to scale appropriately and I want to make sure we get it right. Well, now I have leverage on you. So when your team calls me to make sure this thing gets launched sooner, I'm going to ask to move up on the wait list because I'm going after this to sign up for mine. I saw you had multiple colors even. So re re really exciting news.